welcome to part two of my Jeffrey Jackson special. So to continue from where I left off, um, Angus makes the point to Jackson about the fact that Jehovah's Witnesses have a practice of not reporting to the police unless they are required to do so by law, unless they're forced to do so. And Jackson attempts to explain this and he says, well, the thing is, Jehovah's Witnesses have this ethical dilemma. We're, we're trapped in this ethical dilemma from the Bible. He says, how did the elder get the information that he's been told? And then he, he quotes a scripture in Proverbs, which says, do not rush into a legal dispute and do not reveal what you were told confidentially. And I think that is the very thinnest use of a scripture to back up not reporting about child rape to the police. Do not do not reveal what you were told confidentially. That surely is more talking about gossiping and not, you know, not telling people confidential secrets. It's not talking about when a child is raped. Um, so Angus says, well, OK, you have this ethical problem that you're so concerned about protecting the confidentiality of the person who's reporting it. But what if it's a father and there are other children, younger children, perhaps in the household who are still at danger? He says, by not reporting, you are placing the confidentiality of one person as more important than protecting those that are at risk, which is a great point. He then um, moves on to talk about the two witness rule and the fact that they need two witnesses that have seen the event of sin or a crime, as I would call it, um, before anything can be done. So he says, yes, you may have a report and you may completely believe that report. But if you only have one witness, you're telling us there's absolutely nothing you can do with it. And then Angus himself uses the Bible to distinguish between witnesses to an event and witnesses to the circumstance of the event. And he refers to the case um, where it talks about a woman being raped in the field, but nobody hears a scream and how it talks about a man can be put to death. And he says, well, there is only one witness to that event because nobody's heard a scream. But there are witnesses to the circumstance because when the woman comes back distraught, there are many people that see her distress, witness to the circumstance of the event, but not witnesses to the event. And then he, he deals an absolute brilliant point again from the Bible. So um, Jackson uses this business of Jesus saying on the testimony of two or three witnesses. And Angus says, well, Jesus was referring to the Mosaic law there in Deuteronomy, but he hadn't been asked about the case of sexual assault. He says, surely if Jesus had have been asked about the case of sexual assault, he would have used a different example. He would have used this example that a man can be stoned to death on the report of a witness if he's raped a woman. And Jackson, in the most breathtaking um, audacious statement says, well, that is a question that I would like to ask Jesus in the future when I meet him. But for now, it's hypothetical. What an arrogant bee. So Angus's point is excellent, that if Jesus had been asked about a sexual assault, he may have used a different example from Deuteronomy, where there was only one witness to the event, um, but more than one witness to the circumstance of the event. Angus then moves on to deal another killer blow to the one witness rule by talking about the Shepherd the Flock of God book where it talks about um, when you can form a judicial committee um, uh, regarding adultery or fornication. And what it says in the Shepherd Flock of God book is that if there's circumstantial evidence, for instance, if people see a brother's car parked outside a sister's house all night and those two people aren't married, then, then you can form a judicial committee. And again, Angus says nobody has seen the actual event. Nobody's seen the sin, 
but people have seen the circumstance of the sin. So he's saying you can disfellowship someone if their car is parked outside somebody's house all night when nobody's seen them. You can use a one witness um, thing there, but you can't use a one witness thing for when a child is raped. And it's an absolutely brilliant argument. And then they break for lunch. And it seems as if Jackson has faced some difficult questioning and he's had his feet held to the fire a little bit. But every time it gets difficult, they kind of draw back and change points. So I was quite looking forward to what was going to come after lunch. Now, I think there were two really amazing points made after lunch that I will now discuss. So Angus starts by talking about when a person leaves the Jehovah's Witnesses, if they no longer believe, must they be dis they must be disassociated or disfellowshipped. And a lengthy discussion ensues about this. And Jackson disagrees with Stuart and says, no, 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 there's more than those two options. They don't have to disassociate or be disfellowshipped. There's a third option. People can just leave they can just leave and then that's fine and Stuart keeps coming back to this point that he says people are either in the organization or they're out of it if they just leave as in fade away Stuart argues they are still held to the rules of the Jehovah's Witnesses infinitely so he says he brings up this um example of of, he says, for example, if an elder comes round, if somebody's faded away and an elder comes round to visit them and he sees that they're celebrating a Christmas or a birthday, at that point, they will be held to the law of the Jehovah's Witnesses and they will be disfellowshipped unless they choose to disassociate. And Jack Jackson keeps saying, well, if, if they if they acknowledge that they're one of Jehovah's Witnesses and then they're doing one of these things, then yes. But but if they're not claiming to be a Jehovah's Witness, if they've just left. And what Jackson doesn't get is that the point Stuart is making is this. If you leave the Jehovah's Witnesses quietly and you don't say, I'm not a Jehovah's Witness, then you will be held to the Jehovah's Witness rules infinitely. It might be years later, and if you're caught breaking a Jehovah's Witness rule, you will be within their jurisdiction of punishment. And Jackson really doesn't get that. So Stuart says, you're either a member or you're not. And he's saying, well, if they acknowledge they're one of Jehovah's Witnesses, he says, and if they don't acknowledge they're one of Jehovah's Witnesses, then they'll have to disassociate or they'll be disfellowshipped. And then Jackson says, well, you know, the elders aren't like the police. They're not just going to um, show up unless somebody's asked them round because they want to come back to the Jehovah's Witnesses. But that's not strictly true. The elders do sometimes just show up because they're, they're instructed to encourage people back. So it might be that you've left and maybe one or two years down the line, the elders do just show up to encourage you back. And if you happen to have your Christmas decorations up, then you're then subject to the rules. And Jackson is completely unwilling to accept this point. Um, one of the things I should have mentioned before this discussion about disfellowshipping and disassociating and fading starts, Stuart starts the discussion like this. He says, um, do you accept, you, you believe that Jehovah is a loving God? Yes, yes, yes. And you believe he's a compassionate God? Yes, yes, yes. And that his compassion is not restricted to Jehovah's Witnesses? No, no, no. He says, and do you recognise people's freedom to make religious choices? Yes, 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 we recognise that. Um, and so then when he's made this point about if you are no longer abiding by the laws of the Jehovah's Witnesses, you will be disfellowshipped or you have to disassociate. He then makes the point, well, then you, you're not really respecting people's rights to have freedom of religion. Um, he explains, well, he doesn't need to explain, but I think Stuart explains for the audience, for us, that disassociating or disfellowshipping means that you're no longer allowed to speak to any of your family or your friends or the rest of it and he says well then this is a really difficult choice for people 
He says if they don't want to be bound by the rules, they actually have to leave. He says for someone who wants to leave, it's a very difficult choice. He says it's a cruel choice. And Jackson says yes. He says it's a personally devastating choice to lose your whole social network and family. And Jackson says yes. So he says, so shunning is contrary to the Jehovah's Witness belief of freedom of religious choice. Jackson says, no, I don't accept that. And then another discussion ensues about the age of baptism. And this is an interesting point. Um, Stuart raises, you were baptised at the age of 13. He says, and many people are baptised younger than that. He says, do you think that this is old enough, mature enough to make a decision affecting the rest of their lives? And Jackson strangely believes it is because he happens to know many people that are very happy who got baptised really early. Well, I happen to have read many books about fascists and Nazis that were very happy living under that regime because they benefited from it. But that's not the measure of whether it is a good and acceptable regime, whether there are a handful of examples of happy people within it. So Stuart says, it makes your organisation a captive organisation, doesn't it? And he says, is there a scriptural basis for this? He says, yes, 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 yes. Can it change? No. Unequivocally, Jackson says, no. Shunning will not change. He then moves on to the next point. He says, this. I think is the most significant point of the whole discussion, not really relevant to the commission's brief, but very, very relevant to the entire ex Jehovah's Witness community. And I genuinely believe that Stuart was just making this point for us to help us. It says, do you accept that people who want to change and improve child safeguarding are doing it from a genuine position he says and Jackson says yes he says do you accept that the Commission is doing this this process from a genuine position of wanting to help and he says yes he says do you accept that the efforts of the Commission are done genuinely to help and not to attack you he says yes and then Stuart says would you accept that the testimonies of the victims are not just apostate driven lies and Jackson does agree to that he waffles a bit and he tries to caveat it but you will find in the transcript that he did agree to the statement that this process was not apostate driven lies and if there's one thing that you can use with anybody that's that's saying that it's to get the transcript and read that out to them because Jackson does agree that it's done with genuineness and it's done to help and it's not done to attack and it's and it's not apostate driven lies. And I think that is hugely and massively significant. Um, then the judge steps in. And he says to him, so what do you do when you believe the victim, as you say you do? But there's only one witness, so you can take no further action. And he flounders and he waffles a bit. Um, and so the judge repeats the question. He says, what happens if the victim can't go to the police for whatever reason, because they're too young or too frightened, and you believe that the abuse has happened, but there's only one witness, so you can take it no further? He says, the person has is under an obligation to report to you by your own rules and they're looking to you to protect them. What do you do? And he says, well, first of all, the elders should let them know that they can go to the authorities. And the judge says, assuming that they can't, they don't go to the authorities. What things do you put in place? So he waffles again and he says, well, they um, well, they, they can go to meetings and come out on field service but but we can't tell them what to do he says what do you do he says everyone is put on alert it's an interesting statement that and it passes and I'd like to have interrogated that further 
What does that mean? Because we know for a fact that if there is a paedophile in the congregation today, nobody is put on alert. But that statement passes. So after the judge has pressed his feet to the fire a bit more, Jackson says, I would hope that the elder's conscience would make them notify the police. Again, another hugely significant statement. I would hope that the elder's conscience would get them to notify the police. Having gone through this whole argument of saying they're under this moral dilemma and they're not allowed to go to the police and blah, blah, blah. And the judge says, are there any instructions for them to do that? And then Jackson waffles again and says, well, scriptural help would be given. And the judge says, what would that be? Well, he says, we could show them the God's love book. Well, what a, a misnomer of a book. Or we could show them the God's love book and, and, and spiritually help them to become aware. Um, and we, we could help persons by sharing scriptures with them, he says. And the judge says, what if the abuser's in the congregation? And Jackson finishes by saying, oh, well, we're in the process of adjusting our policies. And that's the end of that little exchange. Now, then Miss Thing stands up. Miss Whiffle Waffle. Is it Miss Davis? I, I didn't. I was so tired. I didn't follow up. Which Now, I'm really, really disappointed in Miss Thing because she's not fundamentally not able to put a question together. She, she phrases and rephrases and backtracks on her phrases so much that it ends up as not a question, but a statement. And so Jackson's off the hook for ages while she waffles on. All he has to do is just sit back and listen. And then at the end, if it's not a question, she'll put to him a really easy to agree with statement, something along the lines of, and can you agree that you will examine this? Well, of course he can agree that he'll examine it. He can agree that he'll examine everything. That's easy because you're not agreeing that you're going to change anything. So she really lets him off lightly and she's clearly not as she's either not as sharp brained as angus or not as eloquent or she hasn't put as, as much preparation in because what she needs are short clear questions that she asks him and she doesn't however she does say one really good thing she talks about when bcg finds out that her father's been reinstated and that she's a grown-up woman and she says she writes an impassioned five-page letter to seek help from the branch in Australia. She says she's a devout young woman, a devout Jehovah's Witness and she sends this letter and she says the, adv the advice that she gets back is that she can look forward to the new world of peace and she puts that to him and Jackson is then I'm a very humble man act. Oh, I'm that's terrible. If that's the only help she got, he says, that that's terrible. Of course, she should have received more help than that. And then later on, he, he argues, well, I can't believe that that's the only help she would have got. But he does say, would you convey my heartfelt apologies to this woman if that's the only help? Well, look, it's too late. It's years too late. You can't know about a child being abused and not deal with it year after year after year and then when the highest court in Australia finally points it out to you just go oh will you tell her I'm really sorry so that bit sickens everybody um and she the, this miss thing waffles on a bit further and then the judge finally makes a point about testimonies and how they seem to separate the testimonies of um, Jehovah's Witnesses against the testimonies of unbelievers and it all kind of abruptly ends and we're all left feeling a little bit disappointed that he's been let off in a way from some of the more difficult questions like who is responsible for making these policies who wrote these policies who enforces the policies will the policies be changed they don't even talk to him about this process of telling them that they will have to draft a report that um, outlines the problems and the solutions and then the, the court will revisit it in two years they don't talk to him about the issue of 
Tockley and O'Brien lying under oath. Um, they don't talk to him about the issues of how everybody has said, we phone the branch, we phone the branch. And then the branch has said, well, we check with the governing body. And now here's the governing body. And he's saying, oh, well, that's the writing committee or that's the legal department. Or, or if, Mr. if Mr. Spink says that, then that must be true. They don't pin him down to saying everybody in your organisation has passed the book up to you. And now you seem to be passing the book back down and dissipating it among your committee, your committees, this committee, that committee. So the upshot is basically Mr. Jeffrey Jackson, he doesn't write anything. He doesn't authorise anything. He doesn't enforce anything because if they if they presented an incorrect version of the Bible, then the whole Jehovah's Witness body would be aware of it. Um, the branch can write what they like as long as they check it with the governing body, but that would just be to check it spiritually. That wouldn't be to check it for spellings or anything like that. All he does is something to do with translation. Um, he really doesn't know anything about um, the writing committee or the publications or or the disfellowshipping or any of the procedures that were mentioned. Um, theocratic warfare is never brought up. And really, we all feel a little bit disappointed. On reflection, as disappointed as I am, I personally felt that, that um, Angus realises he's not going to get anything out of this buffoon. He realises that here is a man who can dissipate all responsibility to others. And if you questioned any of the other governing bodies separately, they could do the same thing. And it seems that, in fact, you can drive, fly an aeroplane by committee, because that is exactly what's happening within the Jehovah's Witnesses. However, this will not change what the Royal Commission does. It will not change the fact that they may change the law. It will not change the fact that they ask the Jehovah's Witnesses for a report. The one thing I forgot to say was this. Uh, Jackson at one point says, well, of course, this ethical and moral dilemma that we face about not being able to report, it would be so much easier if you just brought in mandatory reporting and then we'd know what to do. Well, I'm sorry, but I don't know any other human being in the world that faces a moral or ethical dilemma about whether to report that her child has been raped. These are the only people I know that have managed to froth up a dilemma about it when no dilemma exists. A child has been hurt, you phone the police. That's it. It's not difficult, it's not hard, you're not breaching anybody's confidence. In school, the very first thing you say when a child starts to tell you something is you say to them, you realise that I cannot protect your confidence, that there may be people I have to tell. And you have to tell the child that because often the first thing they do is beg you not to tell anyone. Miss, don't tell anyone, but... And then this horrific story comes out and you have to tell someone. You have to report it. And so you have to tell the child, I cannot guarantee your confidence if a crime has been committed against you. And I was in that position where I had to report something that a dad had done to a little girl who came and spoke to me and begged me not to tell anyone. And we had to phone social services and social services had to phone her family. And obviously her family battered her for telling someone. And she came back to school the next day and she was so angry with me, livid. I, I begged you not to tell anyone. And I said, I'm not able to offer you that. I'm really sorry. And that little girl hated me forevermore. And I really did feel for her. But that is the law for teachers. If somebody is harming a child, however much the child doesn't want you to tell, a crime has been committed and you have to report it for their safety and hope that when they're older, when they're grown up, they'll understand that you were looking out for them. You cannot guarantee their confidence. It's not a moral or ethical dilemma.
So that comes to the end of my initial thoughts about Jeffrey Jackson. He's an incompetent buffoon. I suspect they all are. The Jehovah's Witnesses is run by Keystone Cops, idiots, fools, um, Alzheimer's patients, special cousins and committees. And if people choose to remain within that organisation, that is just a desperately sad thing. Thank you for listening to my thoughts.